Hi, welcome to Tradition Today. I'm Father David Smith, and I welcome you not only to Tradition Today, but also to my study at uh, St. Sophia's Greek Orthodox Church in Syracuse, New York. One of the things that I uh, think is very important in my own ministry is preaching. I think that, uh, especially in our culture, it's uh, critical that priests and preachers uh, have well-prepared and uh, interesting and creative sermons. And so I very often will uh, find myself looking for inspiration and uh, going back to the sermons of St. John Chrysostom or uh, St. Gregory Palamas to see how it was that, that they conveyed truth. Uh, but of course, the greatest place to go is to the scriptures themselves, to the gospels, and, and particularly to the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the, probably the preeminent sermon that everybody thinks about is the Sermon on the Mount, and that's in the Gospel of St. Matthew. And uh, I, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew and specifically about the Sermon on the Mount. We'll spend a little time meditating on that today. Now, St. Matthew's Gospel is known as the most Jewish of the Gospels. And there are a number of reasons why people say that. Each gospel has its own unique identity, but uh, St. Matthew's really does have that, that kind of a, a Jewish quality to it. When, what you see, uh, here's one reason I say that, what you see in St. Matthew's gospel is our Lord presented as the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy of Old Testament prophecy. So again and again, St. Matthew's Gospel will, will tell us that a certain thing happened and that was in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Other Gospels are it's somewhat interested in that, but not nearly as much as St. Matthew's Gospel. Also, we have uh, uh, the phenomenon that in other Gospels, when particularly Jewish things are mentioned, there will be an explanation of what they are. A simple example is in St. John's Gospel, where he says in chapter 6, uh, and when the Passover, a feast of the Jews, had arrived. And so he has that little that little phrase in there, a feast of the Jews. So he's assuming that there are going to be people reading uh, the gospel who are not Jewish. St. Matthew really doesn't think that. There's, uh, there's a passage in there uh, from uh, chapter 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the point about that is that he writes about Daniel the prophet, about the holy place, about the abomina abomination of desolation, and so on. And he, it is his expectation that you reading this would know what he's talking about. Another sort of uh, uh, extreme example, I guess, in St. Matthew's Gospel is when he's talking about the Pharisees in chapter 23. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Well, how are you supposed to know what a phylactery is, you know? Not many people do unless you're unless you're Jewish, unless, you're, unless you are from that tradition and know that it's something that somebody would wear on his forehead containing the words of the law. So, um, and then there's a third reason. The third reason is that uh, there is an emphasis on, in all of the Gospels, on our Lord's mission to the Gentiles. And of course, certainly, in uh, St. Paul's writings, there's an emphasis on the mission to the Gentiles. But St. Matthew's Gospel has just a little bit of a twist on that. He makes it clear that salvation must be first preached to the Jews before the Gentiles. 
chapter 15. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in chapter 10, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go the way of the Gentiles, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, so you can see, St. Matthew's Gospel has a Jewishness to it. There's another point in it, and that is that the, the law of Moses in St. Matthew's Gospel is always seen as eternally valid. So the, the, in the New Testament, in the incarnation of Christ, and the, and the preaching of the gospel, you have the law of Moses not set aside, not annulled, but fulfilled. In chapter 5, Assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor one mark will, be, will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And so there's that emphasis that the law is eternal, and the coming of Jesus does not nullify that. Um, uh, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. This is from chapter 23. Uh, For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. But listen to this part. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he's, he's not saying, you know, you shouldn't worry about the law, but you need to worry about mercy and justice. No, he says, you know what? You need to do what the law tells you, but you also need to worry about mercy and justice. Now, that particular point, the point I've just made about the law, is a little bit of a tricky matter in the Gospel of Matthew. Because our Lord, uh, again and again, we see stories in the Gospel of Matthew where our Lord is uh, at least perceived to be violating the Sabbath. And as he said, uh, the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. And so again and again, the Pharisees are accusing him mostly of violating the Sabbath. And so when they decide to kill him, when they decide that Jesus needs to die, it is about that one issue. You know, that's the thing that fires them up the most. And finally, uh, St. Matthew's Gospel, most Jewish of the Gospels, because it's the only Gospel that uses the word church. Now, that's important because for for the Jews, that gathering place was critical. That place where they would come together, the synagogue or the temple, the place was central to their, uh, to their faith. And so, it, it, so St. Matthew carries that element over into Christianity so that the church not just what you believe as an individual, but the church as, a, as an institution, a divine human institution, is very critical in the Gospel of Matthew. As he says to uh, St. Peter, as you know, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I, I say all of this in order to introduce my, uh, you know, meditation upon the uh, Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I say all of this because the Beatitudes are really seen as a corollary to the Ten Commandments, all right? So you have in all the Gospels Jesus going up on a mountain. But in the other Gospels, Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray. He goes up on the mountain to fast and to pray. In St. Matthew's Gospel, he goes up onto the mountain to teach, and he brings a, a teaching from God, a teaching about God. And so this, the reason, the reason I mention this, this correlates to Moses. 
when Moses goes up onto the mountain, he goes up to fast and pray, yes. But what does he come down with? He comes down with the Ten Commandments. So, in a way, when our Lord goes up onto the mountain at the, be at the beginning of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, what he does is he begins his sermon with the new Torah, with the new teaching that comes from God. This is the beginning of chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... See, so what he's done is he's, he's done the same thing that Moses did. And what we're going to hear is the New Testament version of the Ten Commandments. And here they are. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when men, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, known as the Beatitudes. This passage then presents us something that's very different than the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were really uh, 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 had to do with this world. Three of them had to do with God. Seven of them had to do with your relationships in this world. But either way, it was a matter of of how you conduct yourself in this world according to the will of God. You know, keep the Sabbath, obey your parents, do not murder, do not steal, and so on and so forth. They had to do with this world. These are not prescriptions at all. They are not uh, rules for living at all. They really teach us about what we are going to be in this world as we prepare for the next world. So they really, uh, they provide a link that almost goes in the other direction. The Ten Commandments, God speaking to us, and in the Beatitudes, the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, lifting us up into the kingdom to come. So it begins, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he starts with that because that's where we're going, the kingdom of heaven. The where we live here in this world is not the kingdom of heaven. It is not the kingdom of God. It was given to us as a gift by God, but we, every day, with our decisions and our sins, we, every day, take the gift that God has given us and hand it over to the devil. So we live in the kingdom of the devil. It's only by walking into the church that we're able to walk into a place that is the kingdom of God. If you don't believe that the world is the kingdom of the devil, I know some people think that's a little extreme to say that, but I think all you need to do is open up a newspaper and you'll agree with me. So what he is saying is he's introducing us to that other kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does it mean, poor in spirit? Does that mean I should not really be a spiritual person. No, I don't think it does mean that. 
I think he he is going he is telling us that he's not speaking about this world because we are to be in our spirits poor in terms of this world. We are not to be connected to the things of this world. See, the opposite of poor in spirit is not rich in spirit. The opposite of poor in spirit is rich in materialism. So in other words, poor in spirit means that you may have whatever you have in this world. You can be wealthy or you can be poor or you can be anywhere in between in terms of the things of this world. You can have great things in this world and a great family and so on and so forth. You can have all of those things in this world, but you, you cannot be attached to them. For the kingdom of heaven to be yours, you need to be disattached from the things of this world. It's sometimes harder uh, to achieve than we can even imagine. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit really means that we rely continually on God and we are not rich in the things of this world in terms of our spiritual lives, but our spiritual lives are continually in touch with God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So again, our Lord is telling us something about what it means to be part of his kingdom. Does it mean that you're going to be happy all the time? Does it mean that you're going to be healthy all the time, that everything is going to be wonderful for you? No, not at all. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I've opened up the scriptures here to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 10, where St. Paul says to the Corinthians, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of this world produces death. So there, is, there are two kinds of sorrow. There's a sorrow that is related to this world. And the sorrow that's related to this world is almost always a byproduct of pride. When we believe that we deserve more than we're getting, when we believe that we deserve to be treated differently than we're being treated, or whatever the case may be, we lend ourselves to that worldly sorrow, that worldly sorrow that leads to death. Because it's a, it's a, um, uh, a sort of an, an exchange that you can get into and you won't be able to get out of. I deserve more than I'm getting and that makes me sad. And I'm not getting what I want because I'm sad and that makes me sad and back and forth and back and forth. And this is the mourning of this world. On the other hand, there is the mourning, as St. Paul says, that leads to repentance. So what do we hear? That repentance is really the, a central, is the central uh, issue when it comes to entering the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without repentance. And repentance is never a pleasant matter. It is never pleasant for me when I go to confession. That is never a pleasant thing. To, to actually to sit and to take a real hard look at who I am, what I do, what I think, what I say, and so on and so forth. To take a really hard look at that is never, it's not something that's going to make me happy. I don't, not even really happy afterward, even though I've been forgiven of those sins and I feel so much better, I feel so much lighter. Still, I know who I am and I've confronted who I am. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who repent. Blessed are those who take a look at themselves and face the sadness that the picture brings. Blessed are those. Why? Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. So the mourning of this world, the sadness of this world, when it is repentance, leads us to the next world where there is no more mourning, where we are comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians back just a little bit, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in particular. Now, it says, blessed are the meek, but does that really mean, uh, is, that, is that like cringing servitude? Is that, does that mean, oh, I'm so meek, I let anybody do what they want, and it's okay, and I just keep my mouth shut? And No. That's not what the word meek means in the New Testament. What would you do with St. Paul then? I mean, St. Paul's the very opposite of meek. He, the best thing to St. Paul was to start a riot and then jump into the middle of it. He liked that kind of thing. And so uh, the word meek has to mean something very different in the New Testament. Uh, I'm looking at 321, and it says... Uh, therefore let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So this is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What St. Paul is saying here is that True humility is a matter of submitting your will to the will of God. And when you submit your will to the will of God, everything around you belongs to you. Everything that has ever existed belongs to you. You are, you are His servant. You have become, through adoption, uh, the brother of Christ and the Son of God, you are one of his children. And so being one of his children, it's like being the children of a, a child of a billionaire. You know, at some point, this is going to benefit me, right? And so you, when you submit yourself to God, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, blessed are the ones who have submitted their will to God. Because why? Because Everything belongs to them. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, this, this is an interesting beatitude. The other beatitudes are really, in, in my opinion, they're talking about place and about a state of being. So if I'm mourning in this world, I will be comforted in the next world. But this one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, I think introduces an element of time. Hunger is something that occurs in time. I might be hungry now, but then I eat something and I'm not hungry anymore. But then after a little while, I become hungry again. And so this is something that occurs in time, hunger and thirst. And so you're hungering and you're thirsting for righteousness. And what's going to happen is that there will be a time when you are filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is something that happens over and over and over again. You get hungry every day. Maybe you get hungry several times during the day or thirsty every single day. And every day you hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then you look around you and you recognize, you recognize God's righteousness all around you and you're filled. If you hunger for righteousness, you're going to see God's righteousness and he is going to meet you even with his uh, mercy and love. Now, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
I think that this one is kind of linked with the one sort of uh, two Beatitudes after it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the merciful, and blessed are the peacemakers. I think that this, these Beatitudes, they're talking about the church. I think they're talking about our relationships in this world. You are expected to be a merciful person in this world. Now, other people may not be merciful back to you in this world. That almost always happens. Our Lord knows about that, and I'm sure probably you know about that. Blessed are the merciful, though, because you have to continue to do that no matter what the reaction is from other people around you. Who do you obtain the mercy from? That's what it says. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You're not receiving it back from the person that you were merciful toward, but you're receiving it from God. This creates peace if not peace between you and the other person, because sometimes it's completely out of our control whether or not we are at peace with another person. Maybe it doesn't, but it does create peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So isn't that, it's your relationship in this world is reciprocated in your relationship with God, right? That's not, that's, it's like uh, one of the commandments. It's like the commandments. You know, obey your mother and your father and it'll go good with you in this world. Do not murder, do not steal, don't bear false witness, and so on and so forth. That has to do with relationships and the fulfilling of those commandments has to do with you doing the will of God, you being at peace with God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I love that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Can we ever be completely pure in our heart? I don't know that we can. I don't know that we can over any length of any period of time, but I know that we can try. I know that we can work toward being pure in heart. What does that mean? That means that you're trying continually to do the will of God, to submit your will to God. You're trying to keep God ever before you. You are trying to worship God, and so on and so forth. You, the pure in heart is the person who's continually, day by day, moment by moment, looking to God and trusting in God. That's purity of heart. Your heart, which is, uh, contains your will, your heart is uh, what you want to do. What do you want? Where is your focus? And so that is what leads us to God, is that continual focus on Him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then, you know, it ends, the the Beatitudes end with two Beatitudes that both have to do with persecution. And this this is unsettling, I think sometimes because it tells us about our our uh, place in this world our place we are never going to be of this world we should never be of this world we should never think of ourselves that way sometimes christianity or christians or the christian church thinks begins to think of itself as a worldly institution I've been in some churches that are just absolutely magnificent, magnificent buildings. And, and it, when you're in there, you have that distinct impression that this is an expression of our strength and our presence uh, in this world, our ownership of the culture, 
our ownership of the nation and so on and so forth. There's kind of, you know, that kind of thing. The church should never do that. The church can build buildings like that, yes, but in our hearts, we can never be that way. We will always be a persecuted uh, uh, people because we are followers of God and we are not living in the kingdom of God. It's like somebody living in the United States who pledges loyalty to another nation. That person is never going to feel at home, never going to feel apart. And everyone else will look at that person with suspicion. And this is exactly what we are as Christians, living in someone else's kingdom, but being loyal to God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This speaks of the martyrs. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. They are doing what God wants. They are fulfilling His will, and they are persecuted and perhaps even killed for it. These are the martyrs who are ushered into the kingdom of heaven immediately upon their martyrdom. Blessed are you when men revile and persecute you and say all evil against you falsely for my sake. So our Lord is saying it's not simply martyrdom, but it may simply be that people just don't like you because you're a Christian. You have to expect that. You have to uh, 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 still trust in God and still trust in the gospel message. Rejoice. What does he say? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward. You're not, it's not going to change here. This is not going to be anything different. Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What beautiful words we have from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Beatitudes from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. I pray that all of us would live in the eschatological reality of these words. And not only eschatological in terms of the end of time, but also the end of our own time, that we would live looking back from the day when we leave this world into our lives now and live out these beautiful words from our Lord Jesus Christ.